Good, excellent. I'm sorry if you didn't. There's not much I can do about that right now. Um, so we're going to kick off the, uh, the afternoon sessions um, with a project that I think is really, really exciting. Like, the future is mobile, right? And it's, everyone's got phones in their pockets, and you see mobile usage taking off. And one of the great unanswered questions is, well, how do we test this stuff? And we're really lucky to have uh, Francois Reynard from eBay here to talk to us about um, iOS Driver, the project that he leads and works on. Um, so please, give him a big round of applause. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm Francois Reynaud. I'm working for eBay. And I'm going to uh, talk today about how you can use Selenium uh, through the iOS driver project to do UI automation of anything that runs on iOS. So I'll go through why um, we decided to choose Selenium for testing iOS, uh, how we can use it to test native apps, hybrid apps, and how that gives you access to mobile Safari, how you can also use the Selenium tool suite to scale everything and have all your tests running in parallel, and then at the end, I will uh, explain briefly what is the future of iOS driver um, and what's going to be released in the next version. So first, a little bit of context. Uh, I'm part of the European quality team at eBay. That's a fairly small team. Uh, we're only, like, only 15 people, and we're responsible for testing everything that hits the European sites. That's not an automation team. That's not a framework team. We do absolutely everything uh, to ensure the quality of everything that's released on our sites. It's not even only web. So we're also testing Windows desktop application, web, um, and now mobile. I'm also a Selenium committer. Uh, I created Selenium Grid 2. And I'm an AV Selenium user. I've been using the project for, I think, at least four years now. And for the past year, year and a half, my main task has been to make sure that everything that we already have can be extended so that we can test mobile. Uh, what we need to test for mobile at eBay is native apps. Uh, our native apps are also a bit hybrid, so we need to be able to test that, and mobile Safari. So the first thing to check is, why did we use Selenium in the first place? Actually, when we started the project, uh, we didn't use Selenium. We used an API that was close to Selenium, but that wasn't the Selenium, the, the pure Selenium protocol itself. And the more the project grew, the closest uh, it comes to the actual Selenium API. So we decided to merge everything. And from version 0 0.4, we're using the plain Selenium uh, protocol. The reason for that is that the API just works for mobile. If you look at the Selenium API, it's for browser automation. So it's not the first obvious choice if you try to, try, if you try to test uh, native apps. But it actually just works if you consider that the Selenium API does a little bit more. It does very little focused on the browser itself. It describes how a user can interact with a UI how to select an element and interact with it. And that is completely applicable for mobile, whether you use native, uh, native apps or mobile web. It also makes my work much easier. If you have an API that is super stable, you basically have your roadmap for the project already. You have the list of the 70 calls that you need to implement. They are not changing. They are really stable. So you know exactly what you need to do. And it also gives you re reusability. It gives you reusability in like two different areas. When you're working on the framework itself, you can reuse a big chunk of the Selenium code. You can reuse all the tests to validate that your API implementation works. And you can reuse all the, all the help that you get from the project. If you're writing the test, you can reuse, I mean, the tests are going to be slightly different because mobile is not exactly the same thing as the web. But at least for eBay, a big chunk of our test is how do we prepare the data? How can we set up the, uh, the, right, uh, the right server and everything? And if you're using an API that is very similar, that you're using the same client, you can reuse all those helper methods. What you can also reuse is all the knowledge that your team acquired in terms of what kind of level of abstraction you're uh, using. 
for the web, we're using page object heavily, we can reuse the same kind of concept for mobile. So the, the driver itself is different, but all the tooling around is exactly the same, so that saves a lot of time. So once we decided to, uh, to go for the Selenium API, we still had a couple of technical decisions to make. Everything in the project can be modified, except for like, those technical decisions, those ones we don't want to change. The first one is we don't want to modify the application on the test. It makes writing the driver much harder, but I think in the long run, that's the right choice. Uh, it's much cleaner. You know exactly, you're testing exactly the application that your user will see. This is also what the Selenium project I decided to go for, and I think that's, there is no reason to do something different. We also don't want to jailbreak the phones. Uh, so we're testing on both simulator and real devices. When we test on real devices, we don't want to jailbreak them. Again, it makes it a bit more difficult to work, but in the long term, it's a cleaner approach, and that's going to that's gonna be easier to maintain. The last one is not really a technical choice. It's more defining the scope of the project. Uh, we don't want to have something that, does, that, that, that is the silver bullet. We want to be really good at driving an iOS device, and that's it. So we don't, it's not a test framework. If you want to assert something, you will have to use an assertion framework to do it. It doesn't force you to use any kind of language. So you're using the Selenium protocol. You can take any Selenium client. You can write your test in Java. You can write them in C Sharp, anything that is supported by the Selenium project. It also doesn't do any kind of reporting. So I'm in the Java world. Um, I'm using TestNG, but you can also use JUnit. You will have to write your own reporter. It has nothing to do with mobile. And again, I think one of the biggest advantage of using the Selenium API is that your tests are still going to work when we release a new version of iOS driver. We changed the implementation, but the API itself is still the same. So if you have a test that is running with the current version 0.6, it will run again with version 0.7. So we improve, as we improve the project, you don't have to refactor all your tests and change everything. OK, so that's to give a little bit of context of where the project is coming from and are, what are the key requirements that we have for it. The project itself uh, is in version 0 0.6. Uh, it's quite mature. It hasn't been um, released for the past two months. So we released version 0 0.6. That's working fine. And we didn't have to do any uh, odd fix or anything like that. The project is on GitHub. Everything is open sourced. Um, we also have some, I think, quite good documentation, way better than what I've done for Selenium Grid. Well, which wasn't too hard. <laughs> and if you, so after you've read the documentation, if you still have some questions, you can go and reach out on uh, IRC or on uh, Google Group if you, have, uh, if you want to uh, send an email. So who's part of the project? That's, just, that's not just me. Uh, a lot of people are helping out. If you're part of the Selenium project, you will know most of them. One person that you probably don't know is Martin, and I have no idea how to pronounce his last name. But he is, I mean, he is uh, bringing a lot of value to the project, and I'll explain why um, at the end of the presentation. That's what an iOS driver test looks like. That's going to be the only slide showing how to write a test. Because this is not exactly the point of the presentation. What I want to show in this presentation is that you can use Selenium to write a native, a hybrid, or a mobile Safari test. And if you're in this conference, you should already know how to write a Selenium test. You can write, if you can write a Selenium test, you can write a Selenium test for uh, iOS driver. And the same way you can have horribly hard to maintain tests with Selenium, you can have horrible uh, tests to maintain with iOS driver. It's exactly the same API. If you decide not to have any level of abstraction, it's going to be tough. So 
what does a test look like? The first thing that you have to do is to create the desired capabilities. It's not exactly the same as for a browser. You don't have a browser name. You have the application name. You have a couple of extra flags. Uh, you have to choose between iPhone and iPad, whether you want the Retina display or the regular display. You also have to choose whether you want your device to be in English or so you choose the language, whether you want the device to be in English or in French or whatever you want. When that is done, you connect using a plain uh, remote web driver. It's exactly, so that's downloaded directly from the project. There is absolutely no change to it. Once you've got your driver, you can use the find element uh, regular API and find anything that you want. If you look at the locator, it's a bit different from uh, the web locator, but that's, I mean, the mapping is quite easy to do, and I'll explain how you can do that. Once you've got your element, you can start interacting with them. So that's exactly the same, the same thing as a Selenium test. No surprise there. You locate an element, you interact with it, and you validate the state at the end of that. So now, now that I've shown how you can leverage Selenium and do exactly what you're doing for the web, I'll uh, talk a little bit about what are the differences. Not everything is exactly the same. So the first thing that the first problem that we had uh, when we started with uh, the native tests, you may not have that if you're working for a US company doing just everything in English, but in Europe, I'm responsible for 12 sites and that's eight different languages. All our apps are localized and if you're using the Apple toolset, everything is very much content driven. If you want to write your page object, you will have to have the content in there somehow. And if you don't want to maintain like a massive dictionary with all the possible localization, you have to find a solution. If you look at this example, that's an Apple uh, example from the Apple Dev Center. It's showing how you can localize everything. The functionality of the application is exactly the same. The only difference is the content. So how can you test that? If you follow the Apple guidelines, inside your app, you will have the localization files. An iOS driver can read that. So what you can do is, instead of having the content, you can use, so you can use the value of those key value pair files, or you can also use the key. When you write your test, instead of saying, so on, instead of targeting Montagne, you can target, uh, you can target the key and let the driver automatically do the mapping based on what the language is for the device. If you do that, that's what your tests start to look like. So that's the part where you don't localize anything. So you can write your XPath or locator based on uh, the English version, or you can have, and you would have to maintain the same string for French and the same string for Chinese in my example. If you use the localization mechanism, you can use the key instead of using, uh, you can use the key instead of using the hard-coded already localized version. And that way you can build your page object without having to worry about the localization. That means that you trust that the localization is right. In that case, you don't test. You, you just focus on the functionality. You can have some asserts later that validate the content. But when you write, when you write your page object, you can focus on the functionality. The second thing, and there I wanted to have a demo, but the screen resolution is not going to allow it. So the second thing is you can't write your test the same way you would do it with your web. You can't just right click when you don't understand what's happening and inspect the DOM. So what we've built is a small inspector that will act the same way that the crawl console is working or Firebug. If you don't know why something is breaking, you can put your breakpoints, uh, show your simulator or real device, open your browser, and go to so wherever your uh, server is running and type slash inspector, and that will show you what your test, uh, what your object tree is. So you can mouse over and see like, what are the different components. On the right hand side, you see them highlighted in the object tree. 
what you can also do is have more details about the objects. So on the right hand side, you have all the attributes for your object, and that's what you will basically use for building your locator. What you can also do is check the, like if when you're writing XPath, you can check if your XPath is valid. So you can, it's gonna highlight automatically uh, what is matched by your XPath expression, and you can make sure that everything is fine. Uh, this is especially useful because it's following the uh, WebDriver API, and if you're doing an XPath uh, selection that is too broad, it will return the first element. In iOS, you have a lot of elements with null attributes. If you don't point exactly the right one, you may end up uh, selecting something that's not even on the screen. Something else that you can do with this inspector is uh, having the localization. So if you look here, everything that I highlighted was in yellow. At some time, it also turns blue. When it turns blue, it means that it found some localization keys. And if you scroll down, you will see that here it found that uh, Montagne is coming from the key root view nav title. So you can use that key uh, into your locator, and that will automatically be localized into uh, whatever you need. The last thing that you can do, and it's not really useful if you're uh, working on local host, but if you're trying to debug something that is uh, remote, you can press the record button, and that will uh, basically transfer all the click to your simulator or real device. It will also give you an idea of what the Java code would look like for uh, those actions. So that's for the inspector. So once you have that, you have everything that you need for automating native apps, basically. The next problem that you have is hybrid apps. So that's an example with the eBay application. Inside, so the way we use, we show the user agreement is not native, it's a UI web view where some HTML is displayed. You could potentially access that in a native way. It's just terrible, and it's, it's, not really, it's not really realistic. If you look on the center column, this is how uh, you see the web page as a native element. For the user agreement for eBay, it's basically a list of a thousand UI static text. They are truncated randomly. There is no way you can work with that. What you can do here um, is use oops, so no demo is use um, the remote debug protocol from WebKit. When you start your app on the device, you can go into Safari and go to Develop. You will see your iPhone simulator and all your real device. If you select the device that you want, you will basically have the Safari debug console appearing. In that debug console, you will see all the HTML DOM, and you will also be able to execute some random JavaScript. If you can execute some random JavaScript, you can build an entire driver for it. So we built the driver for it, which means inside the iOS driver, instead of having the native driver, you end up having in the backend two completely separate driver. One is taking care of the native stuff, the other one is taking care of the web stuff. And that's how you can mix them together into a single test. That's a native app that has, uh, if you click on the web button, it opens a web view. So you start everything, everything is native, and when you reach the point where you have a web view, you can switch to the web mode. And that means in the back end, instead of having the native driver, it will use the WebKit protocol to access everything and to access the DOM. Once you switch into the web view, you can start using plain web driver and select with CSS selector, uh, XPath, ID, anything you want. And you can also so, do some pure uh, DOM actions, get the attribute, you can execute some JavaScript, you can do anything you want like that. So if you have that, you have everything that you can possibly need on iOS. You have the native apps, you have the hybrid apps, when you are in the web mode, at any time, you can also switch back 
to uh, you can also switch back to the native mode and do the native stuff. So you can change the geolocation, for instance, or you can switch the device into landscape. <coughs> when you have support for hybrid apps, you get support for Safari for free, because Safari is nothing but an hybrid app, except that inst I mean, you're not going to test anything native. You don't care if the bookmark uh, functionality works usually. You will, st you will go right into the web view and you will stay there forever. What's good here is that if you have both native and web, you can have native event. So when you run, so that's a test using the iPads, uh, opening a test page and typing some text. Uh, or not. Okay. So it starts the iPad, and when it selects the field to type in it, it doesn't inject the content using JavaScript. It actually uses uh, the real keyboard and type with the keyboard. So you don't have to worry about all the uh, JavaScript events being generated. Everything will work automatically. So once you have that, so you've got everything you need. You have native, uh, you've got hybrid, and you've got mobile Safari. You can start writing all your tests. How do you scale? It's part of the Selenium, uh, it's part of the Selenium uh, tool suite, so you can use any tool from the Selenium tool set. Especially you can use Grid, and instead of having just your one client and your server, you can put the hub in between, and you can start having multiple clients and multiple servers. And what that looks like when you put everything together. So that's a fairly old uh, example. It's targeting version 2.25. So that's, I think, from six months ago. On the left-hand side, uh, you've got a grid with three simulators. On the right-hand side, one real device and two uh, web nodes just to show that you can put everything together. I assume you can't read the code here. But what's important to see is, so there is nothing installed on the machine. You don't need any kind of plugin. I'm using Eclipse. You can use it directly into Eclipse. If you're using IntelliJ, you can have it into IntelliJ. I'm running the TestNG plugin and write the test with TestNG, so I can use that directly. And that runs all the tests in parallel into so the three simulator nodes, the real device, and the two um, the two nodes for the web. When that finishes, you have absolutely no difference between a normal, like a normal web driver node and a mobile node. So all the reports is consolidated. Everything is the same. If you took some screenshot, you can see the screenshots. So it's all in one place. And if you use the Selenium project like that, you. Like iOS just becomes another type of browser with a little bit of different things, but otherwise it's the same. Okay, so that's what's working right now. Um, it's version 0 0.6. It's been there for two and a half months. So what have we been doing for the last two and a half months? The biggest change is, so when we are going to release version 0 0.7, the biggest change will be with real devices. And to understand what we are trying to achieve, uh, you need to understand how the Apple toolset works. When you go into Xcode and you right-click on your device and say convert to a developer, uh, convert to a developer device, what's happening is that Xcode is mounting uh, something called a developer disk image into your phone, and that small server is going to give you access to everything that you want inside the phone. Especially, you will have something called Web Inspector Daemon that will give you access to the web views. And you will have the instrument server that will give you access to profiling uh, native automation. You will have access to uh, the syslogs and things like that. The way iOS driver is working with ver version 0 0.6 is that way. And everything on that slide that is blue is provided by Apple. Everything that is red is, providing, is provided by iOS driver. 
So as you can see, the web inspector part, the web inspector thing is done as part of iOS driver, but the bulk of the work is done by the instrument command line uh, clients that we get from Apple. What that means is that you need to have a Mac to have iOS driver working, and we'd like to get away from there. What that also means is that all the quirks in the instrument command line uh, are impacting us. On the left hand side in the device, the server is working really well. Most of the problem are actually coming from the command line, in the command line tool that Apple provides. So that's what version 0 0.7 will look like. We're going to remove everything that we've done uh, using the Apple stuff for real device, and we will replace it with uh, something called Libby Mobile Device. Libby Mobile Device. If you're using, uh, if you're testing on iPhone and you don't know this library, you should go and Google it and look for it. Uh, Lib So this is the first it. It has a lot of content, all the Git repository, but at the end, it has a table summarizing everything that you can do. And all that is written in C, so you don't need to have any kind of uh, link to Apple. You can have that on Windows, Linux, and macOS. So, in, with version 0 0.7, when we'll move there, we'll be able to run everything uh, with real device on Linux and Windows. It's not fully functioning yet, but there is already a proof of concept working. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So the first thing to notice is it's running on Linux. So you don't need to have a Mac anymore to test on real devices. At the moment, we build an uh, iOS driver for uh, Mac and Linux. But as soon as we, get, we have the time, we'll uh, write the build script for Windows as well. So we start the server. What's also important to notice is that when or you can't see it, but you just have to trust me. When you start the server, you don't have to specify what devices will be plugged in. You don't have any kind of configuration. All the configuration is done automatically. As soon as you plug the device, it's going to be recognized by the server. You can see in the log that it recognizes the, the device and writes all the stuff about the device in its own log. Uh, forget the pop-up. It's VMware uh, getting crazy with the USB connection. I plug my four devices. The four devices are, are recognized by the server, and you can start running your test. At the moment, not everything works, so native apps are not working, but mobile Safari does. So you can start some tests. Uh, this one is a very simple test. It goes to the seleniumhq.org uh, and click on the uh, documentation tab. So you can see everything is working on the real device. You have one single host on Linux controlling as many devices as you want. I didn't have an iPad for the demo, but that would work exactly the same. Um, so you can test everything, again, uh, native, hybrid, or mobile device. And yep, that's it. I think I'm right on time. And I have time for some questions. Yes. There is no such thing as an iOS API. It's using the web driver API. So that's the reference. I think the locator are the same. And if they are not, they will soon be the same. I think we'll meet tomorrow to figure that out. Yes. So it doesn't. You have the same limitation as the one that you have with instruments. So you can handle pop-ups, but you cannot change. You cannot handle the switch between two apps. So if you've got, you know, if you've got a pop-up, then you can interact with that. But if the app goes into the background and another app surfaces, that you can't do. 
Any other question? Cool.